Alrighty, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Volleyball Source Podcast. It is Monday, June 14th. We've had a couple of big announcements in the in the volleyball world uh, over the past couple of days, and that's why Mr. Rob St. Clair, Mr. V- Mr. I, w- I don't know if I'll call you, your USA Volleyball within the Discord for sure. You, you, you and, and, and Blair and, and Blair Lambert, but uh, um, you are here today to discuss the announcement of the USA men's and women's Olympic rosters for the t- Tokyo. I th- they're still labeling it the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, but we all know it's 2021. Um, but yeah, welcome to the show. How are you? You just finished your your own show. Uh, it, it's not the deep corner. It's the uh, the around, around the VLA. VLA. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for having me back. It's been like what two weeks. Uh, like that, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, around the VLA is every Monday at eight PM Eastern on the VLA YouTube channel. If you want to watch a live show with me and my buddy Vince and a rotating guest, and we look at highlights, we had a good one this time. We had a five eight libero bouncing on a seven foot blocker. And we had a guy get absolutely blasted in the face. So that was fun to watch. So Decent. yeah, go check it out. Awesome. But yeah, uh, no no VLA discussion this time. This is all Team USA. And I think the last time I was on here we was the night before USA Canada, right at the very beginning of VNL. And a lot has changed since then, for sure. A lot has changed since then. Uh, we are about to kick off uh, round number four uh, of the VNL. Um, I have to say it hasn't been going splendidly well for either of our teams. Um, we've been getting, we've both been, been getting beat up pretty, uh, pretty well uh, from everyone else for, for for different reasons. Maybe we'll discuss that a little bit later uh, at the end of the show um, because you know we can kind of go about all that, uh, all uh, about that all day. But I definitely want to talk about the announcement of the Olympic rosters. Uh, the women's roster came out a few days ago. Was it Saturday or Sunday? It was last week during the week. It was okay. early. It was surprisingly early. And then the men's came out today. So I was, I was wondering why they announced it so early, especially the women, because I mean, Tokyo is oh, yeah, in June 7th. a month and a half. It was exactly a month, a week ago. Yeah, so that's early. And obviously the women are in the middle of VNL. They just finished round four today. Uh, The men start round four tomorrow morning as we're recording this. And yeah, I I expected really all the teams to wait to name their rosters until after VNL was over. But uh, I was reading up on it and the USA delegation, like the U.S. Olympic Committee gave USA Volleyball a deadline of June 15th to name their rosters. Okay. So this is a, a, a USA specific thing that we actually, I didn't know this until I looked into it today, but we knew that we were going to know both teams by tomorrow, tomorrow being June 15th. So the US Olympic Committee gave all of the sport governing bodies tomorrow as a deadline to name their Olympic teams. So that is why you're hearing these rosters announced a little earlier than maybe expected. But I'm also not surprised at the same time because the U.S. has done this a lot, especially the women. They'll name big rosters for things really early, like in, in the middle of a tournament sometimes. So it's not that ridiculous, but it is definitely worth talking about because both the men's and the women's are the first of any of the Olympic teams to announce their 12. other other teams are just naming the provisional 20 right which is basically you know the the vnl roster so it's right it's it, it, so it is it's, early um i i did yeah, that's I did. not not even news the, the the 20 person roster is not even news worth talking about because no, it's yes, the same as the, as the vnl rosters yeah absolutely i did know uh that it was coming i heard lauren carlini talk about it uh on the out of system uh podcast uh, I don't know if it was if you can't handle the heat. It's one of one of their podcasts. Those boys are doing some some pretty uh, pretty great stuff. But um, I mean, awkward enough talking about Carlini. Um, you know, they it's, it's, it's funny. They were kind of talking about her a, a, in their podcast, and they were being like, "Yo, we were pumping her up and being like, there's no way that Lauren Carlini um, can't make the team.'" And I mean, let's be honest. If we're gonna jump over. Uh, to, to looking at the roster right now, that's probably the biggest omission on the women's team is the fact that Lauren Car- Carlini will be the alternate setter in in favor of Jordan Poulter and um, Misha Hancock. What what are your feelings about that, Rob? So we knew that this was going to be a tough battle between three setters for two spots. Um, all three of them really young. I think Micah Hancock is the oldest at like twenty six or something really young 
Um, so Hancock played in Italy this year for Novara. Bol- Polter played in Italy for Bustor CTO. Carlini played in Turkey for I can't remember who exactly. But Turkish, it wasn't Turkish one- Airlines. Okay, yeah, it wasn't one of the best teams in Turkey. Uh, maybe that has a little bit to do with it because Poulter went to the semifinals of Champions League. Hancock went to the quarterfinals of Champions League. Or no, I think they were no, they were on the semifinals on the other side. Yeah, so correct. They they both. Hancock and Poulter both had significantly better club seasons than Carlini did this year. I don't know how much that had that plays into anything. Um, first and foremost, I think that Hancock was a no brainer to bring because of her serve. Yeah. There is no way that Karch was going to leave that behind. She is such a weapon that nasty left-handed position five to usually position five, like hooking left-handed spin serve. Uh, she set the record the all-time record in the women's italian league this year with 50 aces on the season crazy which is a massive number but you know what's even crazier than that is that she only had 50 errors really she had she, oh wait she yeah had all yep we did talk we about talked this, about right. this yeah i think we i think dan and i talked about this in the european volleyball show when i read that i was i was stunned i thought it was a mistake but it wasn't she served an all-time like level of aces at a one to one ace to air ratio. It's absolutely crazy. So uh even independent of her setting ability, which I think is very, very good, um, there's no way Karch was gonna leave her off the roster for the weapon of her serve alone. Also, she can turn and hit balls with her left hand in the front row, which is cool. So um, that was the one I expected. Um Poulter over Cor- Carlini was surprising to me, but I definitely don't hate it. I think a lot of people on the internet have been just up in arms about Carlini being left off. Uh, you could definitely argue she's the best pure setter of the three. She probably has the best hands of the three, but just for some reason. And so my consumption of women's VNL so far has been exclusively USA matches. I haven't watched any other women's VNL. I've just watched the USA and they just so happen to be 12 and 0 and just destroying just people. They're killing they beat, it. They're running. They're running oh through my everything. Goodness. Yeah, they're playing phenomenal, phenomenal volleyball. They're, uh, they clinched a semifinal spot by beating Turkey today. So um, they're already into the final four of VNL. They are playing. The, the, at the beginning, they were playing a lot of the entire roster that they brought. But last week, once they named the 12 Olympians, they've stuck to pretty much those 12, which once you know the 12, you might as well do that. And I think the men are going to do that too, starting tomorrow. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't have that many more like crazy takes on Karch picking Poulter over, over Carlini. I think Poulter connects a little bit better with the opposites, both Annie Drews and Jordan Thompson than Carlini does. And I think that's really important for the USA offense. I don't know, man. I, I don't, I don't hate it either way. I think Micah Hancock's going to be the starting setter in Tokyo and which one of those two is the backup it didn't really matter all that much to me. Uh, they're again, they're all really young. They're going to continue battling it out for years to come. But that the biggest storyline for sure was was Carlini being left off as an alternate. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. Uh, agree. Uh, but I also agree that I don't think it's that big of a deal. Like I don't yeah. know if God forbid the USA doesn't win the gold because we know like that is that is the hunt. We can we can talk about that oh, a, a little 100%. bit later if they are the favorite. I think it's a unanimous yes. And considering that my uh, team Canada, who has been surprising everyone with some pretty strong play for a young squad here in this VNL, has you know won't be there. So I'm going to be a hundred percent a USA stand uh, come come the Olympics. Uh, but it's very I, kind of you, Ever. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, we got to support the North American volleyball scene more than those damn Europeans. Um, but um, you know what? I, I agree. I, I I got to watch a lot of Jordan Jordan Poulter this year. Obviously, watching Booster Ar- Ar- Arcesio, and I really like the bullish way she sets. You know, and and you're right. I do think that Lauren Carlini is the purest setter. Her hands are fantastic. She runs that two ball very very well like she's she's a weapon out there however i almost wonder if she's almost too much of a star at at the setter position to be the you know the starting and lead setter for team usa you know in a sense that i i think that or my my understanding is that she was always the big star when she played at indiana 
and she she carries Wisconsin. A lot. She did sorry, not play sorry, in Wisconsin. Indiana. You're right. I apologize. Got to be clear about cool. that because yeah. I, as as a, as a huge IU hater, would would never allow one of their players to make the Olympic team. No, <laughs> fair, she, fair she went to Wisconsin. Wisconsin, a much better program than Indiana. And but, yeah, you're absolutely right. She was she was a superstar there, and I think she carries herself a little bit more like a superstar than the average setter might perhaps. And I think that's a really good point because of all people, Karch Kirai, who knows a thing or two about being a superstar has really instilled a culture of not acting like individual superstars on his team. I didn't really think about that until you brought it up, but that totally makes sense because even with the players that he has, he has Jordan Larson for God's sakes. Like she doesn't even carry herself no. amongst team usa as she's like, like the, the, con- best the consummate the like team team player right and exactly i, th- I, and think, I think they all are absolutely and i think we've we've also seen throughout this roster that they really run like they run a full system you know they're not running on the back they're not you know jumping on the back of one player if one player isn't swinging well then they can they can go to another one and i wonder if uh jordan polter just you know embodies that process a little bit more uh, than than Carlini and you know maybe that's why you know I I haven't watched the USA's women's team as much uh, throughout this VNL it's a lot of volleyball to watch in uh, a month span uh, even yeah, even kidding. even for guys like us right and but yeah I don't know I I don't hate it right and I think maybe in the past the USA is no I don't know if it's a downfall but you know it's it's kind of like the the uh the dream team that not the dream team but the um when you guys beat the russians in in hockey oh you yeah miracle on ice in the right? 80s yeah the russians had all of the stars but it was the the team that worked the best together and i think we've seen this american team roll through everyone not because of the star power at, like absolutely like on paper they're the deepest team in the world right now but They've been working so well together within that system and have worked together so so well. So I, I think maybe Poulter just fits in there a little bit better uh, in in the system and is and this is pure speculation, of course. But maybe she's just willing to to put on like uh, a hard hat and more of a workers hard workers mentality than than Carlini is, and ultimately that's why she gets the spot. I think that's a pretty good take. I think. Team USA on both sides, but really the women's really sticks out as them being such a process oriented team. And I know we talked about that as we were previewing VNL a couple of weeks ago for both the US and Canada men's, but uh, there are a lot of results oriented, like dominated women's teams in the world, for sure. The ones in Europe have no choice but to be because it's so competitive. There are a lot of women's teams around the world who, when they don't win tournaments, they fire their coach and they bring in someone else. Like that men's side too, that happens all the time. Not with the US. They are in it for the long haul. They build it that way, like Ever just mentioned. And another thing that's really important to note here, and we'll get to this with the men too, is that like everybody knows, the Olympic roster size is 12. Whereas in every other tournament, it's, it's tough. And every other tournament, it's 14. Also at the Olympics, every match matters so incredibly much. Whatever you are going to do to win one extra point in an Olympic game, you're going to do that. And the, the way that these rosters are built are specifically for like very certain applications in the Olympics. Obviously, you want to have players in case of injury. That's a big thing. But assuming that your starting seven, whoever it may be, is healthy throughout the tournament, what roles are those other five players going to be assigned and called upon to fill? What are they going to be called upon to do at a moment's notice? Are you going to bring in a 6-2 sometimes? Are you going to bring in serving subs? Are you going to bring in blocking subs? Are you going to have a third outside hitter comes coming off the bench if the if the starting the two starters have a short leash whatever if you if you have somebody immediately ready to come in and bring bring a different look whatever it is the coaching staffs of all these teams that are going to have to pick 12 olympians really are thinking about the usages of players down to that specific of a level which is why a couple of the choices were made on the usa men's side which we'll get to in a minute but i think karch has a very specific design for every single player on his team and even I don't think like I personally couldn't really predict a starting lineup for the USA women right now, other, other than Micah Hancock setting. And they only have one libero, uh, Justine Wong Arantes, who's fantastic. I've, I've, I have fallen in love with her game. She's so good. And 
it's 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 really speaks to how difficult it is to be a professional a North American professional libero in volleyball. The fact that she played this year at Wiesbaden, like a smaller club in Germany, like not you know, I I think that they're a playoff team, but they're not you know they're not in Champions League. They're they're not in anything like like that. And I watch her play, and I was like, man. I, I love this libero. I love the way she moves. I love the way she communicates. I, I love the way she works that backcourt, and she, she's a fantastic player. Her game has leveled up so substantially in the last four years. When when she was coming out of Nebraska, I wasn't even sure if she was going to have four years worth of a professional career, much less I, I didn't really think she would be in the mix for, for the Olympics about this time two years ago. But uh, her game has leveled up to an incredible degree. You can see it immediately. She has such a, a, a confident and con- commanding presence of the backcourt for Team USA. She makes phenomenal reads. She, I was watching today as they were playing Turkey. She was three steps ahead of all of Turkey's attackers. She was everywhere she needed to be. It was really cool. And um, I, I, got, I heard a little bit of this firsthand from an American setter named Ashley Evans, who I know really well. She played at Purdue and played in uh, Germany this year and was Justine's roommate. So uh, they, the two of them are really tight. And Ashley was telling me the same thing. Like, you have no idea how good Justine wong Arantes is now. And I've seen that this VNL. And another Purdue girl that I absolutely have to shout out is Annie Drews, who She's I honestly don't know. Monster. Oh, amazing. I don't know who's going to start, honestly, between Annie and Jordan Thompson. It- Jordan, Jordan played today against Turkey and looked unbelievable. Uh, but Annie's been like Annie, the reigning VNL MVP from 2019. Uh, a crazy story. She played her first couple seasons in Puerto Rico. Uh, She moved to North Carolina and was less than a week away from starting a full-time job until she got a a call from Puerto Rico to the best team there, where she was on like a very mediocre team before that. And at the last second, chose to continue her professional volleyball career. She was like less than a week away from hanging it up permanently. Got in the USA gym in 2017 at a convenient time when a lot of older veterans were taking the year off. Uh, fill a spot of need immediately and hasn't relinquished it since. So Annie, the first Olympian in Purdue volleyball history, which I'm very, very proud of. I spent five years in that gym when I was in college um, and being from Indiana too is notable. So huge congrats to Annie. And I, I know that she's ready to ball. There aren't very many teams that can stop her. The, the range that she has developed and uh, all the other superstar opposites in the world other than Tiana Boscovich are right-handed. So, and they might be the second best left-handed opposite in the world, which I think is pretty cool. I think the fact that she's left-handed and that Jordan Thompson is this right-handed. absolutely right-handed, but she's an absolute beast. You know, uh, Annie Drews, like she's still big. She's still six foot four, right? So this isn't a, a Ryan Sclater, Shawan Vernon Evans situation where you've got two different types of, of opposites. They're very, they're similar, but different enough to give different looks and, exactly. and, and different enough to cause, to wreak havoc on a team where if you have to have game plan for both of those athletes, and as you said, like I don't, it's kind of a toss up who you're going to go with. It's, it's, very difficult to game plan for both of the, both of those looks because it's good you're between the righty and the lefty they're going to open up different angles they both come in at a different speed they both receive a a, a different ball you know Annie receives like a, a bit more of a loop ball and she's able to cut it off with that left hand and that, that's just lethal right I don't think any any team in the world has the ability to you know to go fire to fight fire to fire with that yeah, it's it's challenging to stop the balancedness of the U.S. offense. And what so before we get to kind of the way that I, I see them matching up with the truly other elite teams in the world, I want to just go down the rest of the roster. So uh, Absolutely. the uh, the standard breakdown of positions applies to this group of 12. This is the the, the distribution of positions that we're probably going to see from almost every Olympic team. That's two setters, two opposites four outside hitters, three middle blockers, and one libero. So um, the, the setters, Micah Hancock, Jordan Poulter, like we mentioned, the libero, Justine wong The opposites are Annie Drews and Jordan Thompson. The middle blockers are Fuluke Akinradwo, Haley Washington, and Shiako Bogu. And the outside hitters are Jordan Larson, Michelle Barchakli, Kim Hill, and Kelsey Robinson. So that's Team USA. That's Tokyo Team USA. And then the alternates, those who didn't quite make the final cut, uh, Catherine Plummer, the big outside out of Stanford, who was another kind of storyline because of how well she was playing early on in VNL. That's definitely Tori Dixon in the middle. Yeah. Sorry. Catherine Plummer is definitely one of my other maybes, you know, like the, 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 to me, the fact that you've got Kim Hill 
and Michelle, Michelle Barr Tackley there, they're both similar types of players. You know, they're a, a little bit older. They're a little bit more experienced. Um, they're not necessarily um, big time. Like, obviously, they're, they're huge offensive options, right? And when both of them played well, they were huge options for, for their team this year, their, this year professionally. Yeah, they faced off in Champions League and Super Finals. Uh, absolutely, they did. But we did see both of them kind of falter at times, right? Like a, a few times, it was only uh, Igonu out there uh, for Emiko, and Kim Hill was kind of nowhere to be found. And when she did show up, that's when they started to demolish, right? And on the the, uh, the other side of the, the net for Iksabaji, it was the same thing with Michelle Bartakli, right? The, the way that they lost to Busto in that f- five-setter uh, semifinal was that Bartakli kind of disappeared, right? So to, to me, I could sm- see the argument of bringing Kathleen Plum- Plummer because she is... She's the face of the program, right? Af- after, like, you know, like Kelsey Robinson is going to be done after this. Uh, Jordan Larson, you know, maybe all four of these outsides are going to be done heading into Paris 2024. And maybe you'd want to bring her to just looking ahead to 2024. And I mean, she's obviously like six foot six. She's an absolute monster out there. So maybe I could see one of those two not going in place of, of Plummer. But absolutely, you're right. I, I do think that's it's it's arguably right or wrong. Yeah, I, I could have seen it going either way there. Uh, the, everybody was was very high on Catherine Plummer's early VNL performances, um, but you've got to remember that Karch and the staff know a lot more than we do. There's a lot more volleyball being played than just what we're seeing in VNL. So I respect these choices and I agree with them because, and the men are the same way, uh, just because you don't make one Olympic roster, especially when you're as young as Catherine Plummer is, does not mean you are not a huge part of the program going forward. And even though you're right that Kim Hill and Michelle barch are, are similar in play style, um, going back to my point about the exact use cases of certain players uh, in, in the Olympics when the roster size is so small and you need very, very specific moments to grab key points at key spots, uh, I think that's a, a bigger reason why Karch went with some veteran presences. And this is Michelle barch first Olympics. She hasn't made an Olympic team before. So congratulations to her. Um, so the rest of the alternates, Tori Dixon in the middle, Lauren Carlini, the setters we talked about, Hannah Tapp in the middle, Sarah Wilhite, S- Sarah Parsons outside, and Megan Courtney, who plays outside professionally but plays libero for Team USA. So those are the alternates. If somebody gets hurt, if something crazy happens, they'll be called on pretty quickly to fill a spot. But yeah, that's Team USA's 12. And before we move on to the men, I'm, I think I'm most curious about Team USA is like we've talked about there incredibly well system built system driven they're extremely well balanced but what's going to happen when they come up against a team with the true one-dimensional superstar firepower of tiana boscovich paule gonu zhu ting of china like whatever whoever they whatever untouchable superstar they end up playing at a key moment in the olympics will be so different than their own style i'm very curious to see how they game plan for that and respond to that because like we've seen the past i don't know ever uh paula egonu is literally undefendable you cannot possibly game plan against her there is nothing you can do so you you don't even think like team usa where you've only got one athlete under six foot can can defend against paula egonu nope like, There's nothing you can do. Like you have the biggest blocking lineup in women's volleyball by like bar none. Doesn't right? matter. I I don't know. I, Doesn't I, matter against her. You, you, and I, I talked about this with Dan on the European volleyball shows. We were previewing the super finals. Like Isabel Hawk on Vakif Bank, you can kind of game plan against because at least where you set up your block can kind of dictate the shot that she wants to hit. Uh, against Paula Igonu, it completely doesn't matter. And that's exactly what we saw in that match because uh, Vakifeng moved their block around. They took her line away. She would hammer angles. They took her seam away. She would hit over the top. They took her cross court away. She would bomb down the line. It really doesn't matter. So uh, that is going to be a really interesting one if the U.S. runs up against Italy at some point. But, but you, I am... I, I would yeah. argue almost that Conigliano is stronger around Agonu than Italy is. Right. They are for and, sure. Like, you know, like the options that she has, like with Kim Hill, um, with, you know, a- Asia for setting, like overall, I would think that the Italian team is definitely a step down from Canigliano, whereas the American team, right, this team USA roster is much better than any roster Canigliano is going to be facing. Right. So uh, I, I do think that the 
I, I don't think like this is going to be a Michael Jordan situation, right? If you're playing against it's, it's a Ganu or it, like a LeBron, however you want to put it, it's not about if they're going to score points. It's how many points are they, they going to score and can we limit those in areas that that we can control and can we limit how much damage the other players on the on the court to us right because at the end of the day like if if they are just rocketing serves from the baseline if they're they're digging balls you know what we've seen aganu go through a few like uh slumps like even in that champions league final there was a few moments in that match where she wasn't there and she wasn't present and she wasn't showing up and that's when exabaji really went for a run for it so i don't know i i think that Hundred percent. Like you, you know what? It, it's funny because the the four team, the three teams that you you mentioned, um, Zhu Ting and China, uh, Agonu in Italy, and then uh, Tiana Boscovich and uh, and Serbia. I really see that as the only three set. Okay, I forget about Brazil. I forgot about Brazil because because they are Brazil. But like the the USA is going into this Olympics hands down the number one favorite. And I mean, they I think they have to be after the heartbreak that they've received at the past few Olympics. Yep, and they, the pressure is seriously on. You mentioned that there are some of these players that this is probably their last quad. I disagree with Kelsey Robinson. She's she's not that old, but uh, Kim Hill, Michelle Bartsch, Jordan Marson, almost certainly their last quads. Uh, so there's there's going to need to be a lot of new-blooded outside hitter. But uh, Fuluka Akinradoo, definitely her last quad. But Haley Washington, Shaco, who are young. young. We, we talked, talked about, about the setters, setters being young. young. Justine Juanrantes is young. The opposites are young, so... Uh, the that outside veteran presence is enormous. The ball control, of course, and the shots that Jordan Larson is still able to hit at her age are unbelievable. She did some today, like ball coming from 30 feet to her right over her right shoulder, and she turned him down the line inside three blockers. Like she's incredible. And then and the way that the USA like, really likes to run Bic, especially in transition, probably better than any other women's team in the world. So the that veteran core of outside hitters is going to be crucial this this Olympics, and it's. I don't know if they want to admit this, but there absolutely is some pressure on this American women's team. I agree that they're the favorites. And the fact that they haven't won one of these things ever is is a problem. It's definitely a problem. They've they've been in three straight um, medal scenarios. Bronze in 2016 in Rio. Silver in 2012 in London. And um, uh, silver again in, in 2008 in Beijing fourth you know fourth place in in sydney like just i mean i think the the worst result one of the worst results they ever got was at home in atlanta which must must be a heartbreaker um but yeah and i i think like especially the the legacy that this team has left the fact that they even never won an olympic championship is an olympic gold medal is absolutely astonishing and i think that's i think that's exactly (laughs) what like you are seeing is that this is the you know, this is like this is Jordan and the Bulls after they after losing to um, Detroit and the bad boys of Detroit for for how many years? You know what? This is it's a very good analogy. Th- this is this is Kobe and and Shaq. Oh, I guess they didn't really lose together, but you know, th- this is the redemption tour, and they are doing taking care of every little bit of detail that they can to um, to to get it done. And you know what? I would bet money on them that that they're going to win because of so many different factors. They're so emotionally mature too. I, I just never see any one of these individual players and the team collectively ever getting rattled by weird garbage that goes on on the other side of the net or anything like that. This is that this team's such a well-oiled machine. The the staff as well is just so well put together. Um, Karch obviously I want to shout out Kara Kessens, who's their physical trainer, who also worked at Purdue when I was there. So. She's going to the Olympics. That's awesome. Yeah, it, I I would be shocked and very disappointed if this team did not win this tournament. They obviously must medal, but that's not what they have their sights set on. Hell no, no. I I mean, I, I to be honest, I, I would go out as far as saying that anything less than uh, a gold medal is a failure. You know, obviously in the grand scheme of things, when they look back at it, and no one's going to say no to a silver at the Olympic Games. But you know what? We all know what the USA is going for. Like the USA goes for one thing in general, and that's gold medals. And uh, you guys have developed that culture for better or for worse. But this time, you know, it's 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 going to be it's it's the one and only goal for Carter and the squad. Agree. This is among the best shots at it they've ever had. They're clearly the favorites going in. It's it's time. This is the year. Right now, we're just look taking a quick look at the uh, VNL women's standings. Of course, the USA. 
12 and 0, perfect 36 points, right? They haven't even gone to 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 five sets yet. They've been absolutely dominant and you know what? As, as to be expected. Yeah, and they're playing against a lot of like we we've already talked about a lot. Teams are taking this VNL strategically very very differently but every single team that has come up against the usa has really not even come all that close they beat brazil 3-0 they beat turkey 3-1 today uh, i can't remember if, if brazil it was one of the teams to take a set off of them a few weeks ago I, honestly i don't remember and it doesn't really matter this this usa team is on a roll um their last i i expect them to probably win their last three matches they'll be the team to beat going into the vnl finals and like i was saying when we were previewing the men like the learning experience of being in a playoff like championship winning scenario is important and is very valuable. And it's something the USA men are not going to get because spoiler alert, they are not making the finals of this VNL, uh, but the USA women absolutely are. And they're going to learn how to take what they believe to be their starting lineup, their starting Olympic lineup and go out and win a tournament. It'll be a tournament of a different scale, but that is still valuable learning experience. So I'm very excited for this USA women's team. And I think it's time to talk about the Met. Yeah. Well, only one team, as I go down, the, just to talk about the US team, only one team, Japan, managed to get into the 20 point range so far uh, against the <laughs> USA women. That's how absolutely dominant uh, they've been. Also, I need to correct myself. I was saying Exobaji was making the the finals it was vodka Vak uh, you're yeah. right i apologize there's just too many too many turkish teams okay there there's, there's, there's a lot of them there's too many and 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 they're 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 all good um but yeah that is the the women's roster now we're going to jump over to the men the usa men have been they've been hurting it's 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 been tough for 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 them at, so far throughout the vnl um a lot of injuries uh, coming in and out. Of course, Michael Christensen leaving for the birth of his second daughter? His, second yeah, his, child, his, his first second daughter. Second child, his first daughter, yeah. So he left uh, about this time last week. So he played the first two rounds of VNL, but left before the third round of VNL and will not be back at all in this tournament because of the way the bubble works. So yeah. he's done. Um, the, US, the USA and the VNL right now are four and five, already with five losses down their starting setter. Um, there is almost no way that they make the finals. And I don't think they care about making the finals at this point. They've lost, they've already lost too many games. They lost to, let's see, Brazil. They lost to Russia. They lost to Poland. They lost to Iran and lost to Serbia. So a couple beatable teams in there that we just really laid down and got walked over by. They were not particularly fun matches to watch, but it's not what, it's about for this USA team and they're dealing with way more adversity than the women's team is like you mentioned. So we've already talked about the loss of Aaron Russell um, dagger. I, honestly, dagger. I think the loss of Aaron Russell is the biggest, you know, the, the biggest dagger to the Olympic hopes of, of this team because it just leaves such a massive gaping hole um, and a lot of uncertainty in, in the, the left side position and yeah, it, you know what? Because not only do you do you not have Aaron Russell out there, but Taylor Sander, who is on this roster, has yet to be seen in in the VNL, right? And he injured his ankle at the end of the season with Scra, and there's been uh, rumors coming out of the USA camp that he's injured. You know, tweaked that ankle once again, uh, but he is on the 12 roster for this Olympic Games. Yeah. So when that came out today, the the two big thing, well, the three biggest things that I wanted to see were who's the second opposite. Who's the third middle blocker and is Taylor Sander on the roster? So the answer to that, that latter question is yes. Taylor Sander is on the Olympic roster. You are right. You have, we have not seen him on the court at all. This VNL we've seen him dress twice once as a libero. And the other time he was wearing the right color. We didn't see him on the floor. So um, there, there's clearly something going on there, but he, the fact that he was named to this 12 man roster means that he is, projected to be healthy enough by the time Tokyo comes around. I really hope he gets in this VNL. I really, really do. I know that this team has a lot of work to do when they get back to LA after this, this Rimini bubble experience is over. There's, there's going to be, there's, there's a lot, lot of very important, important work to be done, done in that gym, gym at that time. And Taylor Sander is going to be a focal point of that, but I would really like to see him get some competitive touches before then, if at all possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's crucial. You know, you don't want to have a show up at the Olympics not having played since March, 
right? The last time you played, you got injured in a season where you were coming off an injury, right? There's just so many question marks right now for Taylor Sander. Uh, and ultimately for this American team, right? If you go into the to the Olympics down Aaron Russell and potentially down Aaron San- uh, Taylor Sander too, and let's be honest, we've only seen Matt Anderson twice so far. Apparently he got a bit of a bit of injury during camp as well, and we you know we didn't see him until uh, later on in, into the event. Or I think maybe three times. I think I think he has three appearance appearances so far. We've seen him play three matches, two at outside hitter, one at opposite, and in all three cases he only played the first two sets, and that was clearly clearly the plan going into all those matches because the last one against Serbia, like he was playing outstanding volleyball for two sets and then went to the bench like that there was no reason competitively to make that move other than the fact that that was the plan. That was the, the pitch count, so to speak, to start to work Matt Anderson back into things. So that's one of the takes that I delivered when I was on here previewing USA Canada a couple of weeks ago that I expected to see a lot of Matt Anderson. I couldn't have been more wrong about that. We've barely seen him at all. Um, but now that the Olympic roster has been named, um, maybe we'll see him a little bit more these next six matches left. Uh, so let's 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 run it down. Let's let's get to the twelve. So again, the exact same position breakdown as the women: two setters, two opposites, one libero, three middles, and four outsides. So the opposites, at least the ones labeled as opposite, are Matt Anderson, as we expected, and Kyle Ensing is the second opposite for the USA. No Ben Patch. Ben Patch is an alternate. That was a huge one coming out today. We'll get to that in a second. Absolutely. The, set, the setters are Micah Christensen and Kavika Shoji. I don't, I don't think I, no 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 controversy there. I think obviously Agreed. Mike Micah is the undisputed number one. We've talked about it. He's the Aaron Rodgers of volleyball, and Kavika Soji is a absolutely solid backup. I don't really know football enough to you know do an equivalent there, but Kavika Soji has just been on this team far too long. And as as good as Tuniga has been coming in, and as good as he was this season in Poland, um, we all know that Kavika Soji was going to be the guy. Agreed, I, especially with this being almost guaranteed his last quad. I think there was no way he was going to be left off this roster. And you're right, Josh Tuaniga's played well. He had a good season in Poland. He's looked good in VNL when he's played. And his connection with TJ DeFalco is an absolute cheat code. They've been playing together for probably 10 years, maybe more. So that was the only reason I was thinking there might be a little bit of doubt in that second setter spot, because as it has become more clear that TJ DeFalco is extremely important to this particular USA roster. I thought because of that connection, Tuaniga might make himself a case to be included here, uh, but not this time. So it is Kavika Shoji, and you can definitely expect Tuaniga to be in the mix throughout the future. Because again, this is Shoji's last quad. He's probably 33, maybe. Tu- not tu- exactly Tuaniga sure. is the second setter for sure heading into 2022, without Agreed. a doubt. And then heading into Agreed. 2024, even, even probably, right? Um, I, I don't know if my, oh yeah, Mike is, Mike is 27. M- Mike Christensen's 27. He'll be around for a while, but yeah, I, I, th- I think that second spot is two and to lose after this year. Yeah, so 100%. anyway, moving on, uh, Eric showed you libero, no brainer. Everybody knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, the, the middle blockers are an interesting one. So coming into this, t- coming into this VNL, coming into this national team season, I expected it to be Max Holt, David Smith, and probably Jeff Jendrick. Mm, really? So, that is what I expected. Yeah. So um, also included on this roster are Mitch Stahl and Taylor Averill on the VNL roster. That is. And let me tell you from what I've seen from Max Holt and David Smith, I am not impressed. It has not been good for either of those two guys. Uh, Smith is completely incapable of connecting offensively with any of the setters and Holt's blocking is a problem. It is so bad. He was, making these miserably late moves as against a, a hitter that will destroy you for that. And in Euros Kovacevic the other day against Serbia, he was so late and keeping his arms way off the net, not creating any seal or taking any space and just, just getting used and having balls go down his chest all match long. It was very frustrating. So I know Holt's coming off an injury. He didn't play all that much this year in Monza, but I have expected him over the last few years to be one of the best middle blockers in the world. And just based on the eye test right now, he's nowhere even close to that. So him and Smith both have a lot of work to do in the gym in Anaheim after this tournament's over. And Smith I'm surprised by because he just won the Champions League and he was amazing for Zaxa this year. So those two haven't been up to their very high standards, but have still been included on the Olympic roster 
to, I believe, nobody's surprise. Uh, Jeff Jendrick, though, the youngest of those three leftover middles in Stahl, Averill, and Jendrick, uh, has been pretty heavily outplayed by those other two guys, this VNL so far. Uh, Jendrick's gone, started a few matches, has gone to the bench. Um, I was very curious to see if it was going to be Mitch Stahl or Taylor Averill to grab the third, the third middle blocker spot in this roster. And the answer is Mitch Stahl. So Mitch Stahl has gotten the nod. And I'm a little bit disappointed by this. I think Taylor Averill has played in a higher level league more recently. He was maybe even the best player in France this year. He was. He, he was named M- MVP. Maybe right? the league as a middle. That's a hell of an achievement. And Stahl was in Belgium for a team that was good, but Belgium is just not even close to as deep of a league as even France. And France not, isn't exactly elite tier either. Um, another really important thing that I wanted was I wanted a float server. Mm, okay. okay. I really, really, really believe that this USA roster needs bare minimum one float server, maybe even two. And Taylor Averill's float serve is outstanding. Mitch Stahl's serve is a, a two-handed toss semi-hybrid thing. It's like, it's mostly a jump spin serve, but he tosses it flat with two hands. It's pretty unique. It's been a, a hallmark of his game ever since he was coming out of high school and played at UCLA, but it's it's error prone. It's, it's a, he's, he's trying to go back and score with it. And I really think that the U.S. needs, needs that float serve change up. And that's one of several reasons why I wanted Averill on this roster. Um, him and Stahl attacking are pretty much identical. Um, blocking, I think Averill's a little bit more fundamental and make a little more technically sound, but Stahl maybe a little bit more athletic. Uh, but really, it was it was the, the addition of a float serve. And also, Averill's a pretty good backcourt defender. I really thought that that, and talking about like very specific use cases for backups in the Olympic roster, I thought that was going to be enough to get him in there. Gendrick too is is a good float server. So uh, neither of them is Mitch Stahl. So I don't really know of any pure float servers on this entire twelve or or eleven serving players on this American roster. Like Christensen does it sometimes. He'll he'll mix it up with a hybrid that he hits flat like a floater, but really he's a jump spin server. Um, Anderson and Singh, Sander, all the outsides, all the middles are all jump spin servers. So I'm disappointed by that. I really, really wanted a float serve option, especially coming off the bench as a service sub. It's less error prone. I think it's important to keep other teams honest with that in serve reception, not to give them the same thing over and over again. So that's the only one of these moves that I'm a little disappointed by because this is a good segue to talk about the opposite. I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled with the choice to bring Kyle Ensing over Ben Patch. What, do you agree with that, or are you a little more on the fence? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence. Uh, I'm looking at the stats here that I had nicely laid out, and then you mangled the formatting in. Um, the, uh, b- <laughs> uh, you know, being fair, you know, Google Drive is a little weird with it, with the formatting and stuff like that. They need to get get bring their level up compared to uh, Excel and Pages. Um, but uh, only two points separate Ensing and uh, and uh, Patch in overall so far. Uh, Patch has scored six, 59 points. Ensing has scored sixty one. Um, and you know what? Like both both of their results have been kind of all over the place, right? You see Ensing with a with a few outings where only he got three points, but uh, you know three outings in the double digits. Uh, his highest outing so far has has been sixteen. Whereas Patch, you know, his highest outing was 18, um, but then he got a four and, and a two. But I guess the day he got two was also the day that uh, Ensign got nine. So they split double duty. Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I just think that sometimes, I, I guess at the end of the day, Patch and Anderson are just too similar of players. And they don't bring a different look and they don't bring a, a different style. Oh, and I disagree with that completely. You don't, you don't, you, I mean... I think maybe in in the like they're both they they both get the same type of ball, right? It's it's a higher ball, right? I don't think it is. You don't uh, think so? The, the patches ball is way higher than Anderson's, uh, and they I don't think they're a very similar kind of player at all. So the, the reason why I think these numbers here don't tell the whole story about the opposites. One, I wish I knew off the top of my head how many matches each has started, because I, I'm. 
I feel like Patch has started more matches than Ensing has, but Ensing has come in off the bench for a very bad Ben Patch several times now. And really, to me, it's just based on the eye test and based on individual efficiency and just team efficiency overall. The Ben Patch has a comically low volleyball IQ for a player at this level. That's a, a huge weakness of his. He is the most explosive athlete in the American gym by far. One of the most no explosive question. athletes in the world. In the world. Yeah, no question about that. But his complete blindness of the block, his lack of court awareness, his his up and down erratic streaky play is not what you want in the Olympics. What, the, what Kyle Ensing brings, and he's brought this every time he's coming off the bench in this VNL, immediately he has an, a, a sense about him that he will make the right play more often than Ben Patch will. Offensively, but just like off blocker defense, not passing a free ball to 15 feet off the net and resulting in having to give a free ball back, like serving a little bit more efficiently. And I don't think Ensing's serve has been that good this VNL, but neither is Patch's. Um, Again, if for the Olympics, you want a guy who has a very specific use case if he's going to be coming off the bench and you know you want to know exactly what you're going to get out of him. With Ben Patch, you really never know. It's and that's why, sure. totally. And that's why he's been given so much time in this VNL because you don't know. And Spira and the staff were hoping that he was going to be able to build some kind of consistency and some level of form that was going to be reliable for the USA. And he has not done that. The, the only thing that's been reliable is the fact that he's had to go to the bench a few too many times. So I think that right there sealed the deal to bring Kyle Ensing. I, I don't think Ensing's not going light to light anything up or do anything all that spectacular, but he's going to be a part of the system. He will make the right play more often. And if called upon in the Olympics, I do believe he was the right choice. And I'm happy about that call. I think it's better for our Olympic chances overall. My only, here's my, my thing. Here's my take on, on the Ben Patch situation is that I and this is pure speculation. I almost wonder if maybe Patch and, and maybe to a certain extent Avril as well weren't picked because of maybe doubts about their abilities to keep their heads down and you know what not be a distraction in the eyes of the coaching staff to the rest of the team because it is the Olympics. It's the biggest stage in the world and I'll bit it's going to be a weird ass Olympics because everything's going to be shut down. You're not going to have fans, right? There's there's not going to be, let's say, the temptations of a normal Olympics <laughs> where we know that you know that things can Enough go said. things Enough can get said. a little crazy. So maybe there is uh, a doubt, and I, this is pure speculation. Um, of course, I personally love both of their Instagram uh, presences and both of their presences on social media. Um, but I think for, for Ben Patch, I, the, the, the consistency is absolutely an issue. However, I do think that Ben Patch is just a straight-up fucking gamer. I think that you saw it this year in the Bundesliga Finals when, you know what, Vak, or, sorry, Friedrich Schaffen, who had been having a, a, an av a, a, a down year for a Friedrich Schaffen up to that point, got absolutely demolished by Berlin in the finals. And Badge, pa Ben Patch was a huge part to that. And I mean, I've MVP brought... MVP of the league. MVP of the league, right? And, I, and I've brought this up before. I always think back to the 2015 Pan Am Games where Canada was just absolutely trouncing the USA in the quarterfinals. It wasn't even close, and it was a B team. I mean, Tuaniga was setting, Patch was on the right side. You had like, guy like guys like KJ in the middle. Um... But Ben Patch just turned on another level and just went absolutely off. And and I think that, you know what, as maybe sometimes volatile he is and as un, unreliable he is, I think that he has that ability to be like, hey, this is a big fucking game. Like, this is the Olympics. And, I, and, like, and I'm going to focus in. Like, I think he needs that pressure to be the, his best self. And other times, like, he knows that he can just get by on pure athleticism and knows that that he can be good. But, man, when Ben Patch is, is, is at his best, he is one of the best. And I'm all That is an excellent point. So I, I, addressing the, the potentially, 
like social media distracting kind of personalities of guys like Patch, Averill, Dustin Watton for sure. Like Watton never had a chance. He was never going over Shoji, but um, you might be onto something there. And also worth noting that I just kind of remembered right now, I, I don't know about this for sure, but it looked like maybe Patch was having a couple issues with his knee in the last match that he played. So maybe that's not totally 100%. Maybe that had something to do with it. Anyway. Um, you're absolutely right about his ability to completely change your game. And an argument to be made for him is that in the Olympics, in a, in a situation where he would be called upon to come in, there's a good chance that that situation would be in desperate need of somebody to come in and completely change the game. And so far, this VNL, I know it has been the usual U.S. team that we're used to seeing, but our high ball scoring ability has been hot garbage. Absolutely nobody is able to bring firepower and actually score on the pins out of system. Like there are a lot of guys making good choices. A lot of guys doing, you know, resets into the block. They're not making errors, but they're really largely unable to score. And what Ben patch is going to do pretty much no matter what is end a play when he touches the ball for, for good. Or yeah. For, worse. for, for good right. or for bad. Exactly. And there is something to be said for that style of a player. I think a, a terminal opposite is sometimes a very, very valuable thing. So there, I, there is definitely something to be said for Ben patch's ability to come in and change a game completely. And if you get lucky and you get him on a good day, look out, like you mentioned about the, about all the way back in 2015. But I think, Spiraz style and I'm, I'm not surprised by this choice just because of his personality he, he wants he wants to know he wants to be in control he wants to have reliability he wants to have consistency and maybe he wants a guy like Ensing who will just kind of keep his head down and take the entire Olympic experience top to bottom super duper seriously I think there's definitely something to be said for that absolutely and, and I, I almost wonder if is Patch the type of player player who can only start Right. Is he the type of guy who can't come off the bench? You know, whereas I think that that Kyle Ensing is terrific not, off the bench. Absolutely yeah. ter terrific off the bench and, and not necessarily just happy to be there, but also happy to be there. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you're not wrong. I, you know, I and, you. and it's it's kind of one of those scenarios that be like, hey, coach, I'll play whatever position. And I don't think he even necessarily needed to vocalize that. I think it's just right. his energy, just, the energy that yeah. he, he brings to the gym. Right. Um, and and as much as you think that that patch and Anderson are different style players and i do agree i do think that there's a vast difference between a much vaster difference di in different style stylistically between patch and anderson uh or sorry um anderson and ensign than there is patch and anderson right oh, yeah. and and that yeah, at that point you can run with a smaller ball offense you can run it a lot faster on that right side like we know that ensign can hit and i mean he's not that much smaller he's still six foot seven like he's still a present out there right but I do think that it just gives a, a different look. You can bring him and Kavika in, and dude, that's a great look on the, on that double sub, right? That's the one thing that I can guarantee you will not happen. This this USA team will not double sub. Really? They why not? Just never, we never ever. It? They they have this VNL, but that's because Anderson hasn't played and Christensen had left. But why you don't ever need to take Micah Christensen out of the front row. I guess you're right. You he's, he's certainly you certainly don't want to take Matt Anderson's attacking ability out of the back row. You don't want to take him off the service but, line. But maybe you do in a situation where like maybe there's a little load management going on with, with Matt Anderson. Uh load management is a different story. And and that that might be the only reason that I could that Spira would even consider the the six two. But the US has never been a team to do that. Like Micah, one of the most physical, like best front row setters on the planet. Anderson, 6'10", and hits literally the same ball front row and back row and has played outside. He's a great defender and one of the most lethal servers in the world. So I personally don't see it. And with, with the starting lineup that we're kind of expecting to see, I can almost guarantee you that won't happen except if something like loads, load management is going to be needed. And another another thing about Ensing, um, there's always the option that Matt Anderson can swap over and play left side. And in Aaron Russell's absence with, we'll talk about the other outside hitters in a minute, but with what we don't, we don't really know what we're going to get across from Taylor Sander. And we don't even necessarily know what we're going to get with Taylor Sander. So maybe I think the outsides are a complete toss up. It's right? They are. So maybe in a situation, the team needs Anderson more on the left. In that case, you bring in Ensing and he takes, like a second outside hitter role, but as an opposite, you you lean on Anderson to score a little bit more on the left and out of the pipe, and Ensing doesn't see a normal opposite volume of balls, but he makes all the right plays like a backup outside hitter is supposed to can do. He, so can he pass? 
right? Like, like if, if you've got Anderson in a pinch, a, yeah, a, oh, on yeah. the left side, and especially if he's in the front row, can you, uh, and you know, bring uh, drop him down and, and have him oh, pass sure. that ball? Oh, yeah, yeah, he, he can he can pass as the fourth guy, but you'll never bring him in in place of Anderson, mm, fair enough. And I don't, I don't think you would ever need to do that because Anderson's so good at that. He, I mean, he was he was an L2 most of his career, he played with Wilfredo freaking Leon for like five years, so. Yeah, but yeah, like the yeah, the, possi- but, the possibility you know, of Anderson playing outside this Olympics is higher than ever since he made the position switch because of Russell being gone and Sander being a question mark. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a lead in to talk about the rest of the outsides because there are four of them. And once we knew Russell was gone, I think it was pretty easy to predict these four. But what we don't know is who the heck is going to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think TJ DeFalco has made an absolute great case for himself to be that Maybe that number one guy in the, in the absence of Taylor Sander, he's leading the team right now and scoring with 84 points, right? Has been by far, I'd say, one of the most consistent players that they've had across the roster. He's been phenomenal, right? Yeah, and I think he's been really, really good just based on the eye test too. He's doing everything really well. He passing is passing well. He's playing good defense. Right. He's, he's a great, balls. great blocker on the left side. He is a fantastic, fantastic fundamental left side blocker. He's not that big but he makes really, really good moves. And uh, the play he made, like the the Vladimir Gerbich play, where he chased down a ball, jumped over the barrier, came back and stuff blocked a guy immediately was maybe the play of the tournament, in my opinion, which is really cool. But I think just the way, like the amount that he's been used, I think he's started more games than anyone else in this American roster and leading them in scoring for that reason is, is a decent indicator that Spira really, really wants him in there in the Olympics, perhaps as a starter. And we haven't seen Thomas Jeschke nearly as much as I thought we would. No. So if I had to guess right now, it very well could be Taylor Sander and TJ DeFalco. I, I might say it might almost be TJ DeFalco and Garrett Mountatia. You know, what I'm they- I'm holding out hope that my favorite player in the world is going to be healthy enough to play. But uh, if not, yeah, you might be onto something. You know, it may, but it may not even be healthy. It might just be rusty. You know, it might just be lacking the the reps. And and lacking the the time with the team to to gel with that with the team. I mean, Mangatia Tutia has been solid, and I mean that's as as we can can come to to uh, expect. But you know, we as you said, we've barely seen Jaishki, and he's another guy that has missed some time on the roster the past few years due to due to injury. So it's I I think the 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 left side hole that is Team USA right now is your biggest issue. Right. And for sure, for if, sure. If, if, even if, if, if Aaron Russell was here, it would be a much different story. Um, but I think ultimately that is going to be what the, the downfall is. I mean, at the end of the day, I still think that you have Michael Christensen, you know, and in the same way that Aaron Rodgers can lead the Packers to an AFC championship game two years running without a first round draft pick as, as a skill player. You know, I, I think that Mike Christensen has this ability to put the team on his back and be like, let's go, you know, especially with the, with the guys around him as well. But at the end of the day, are they going to be competing with Poland? Are they going to be competing with Russia? Like that, though, you know, are they going to be going toe to toe with Brazil? Exactly yes. what I was just about to bring up is that how is this particular USA team going to compete with teams at that level? Brazil, Poland, Russia. Uh, I can tell you how it's gone this VNL so far. It's not been good at all, except the one set against Russia that we turned it around and actually played really well. Um, other than that, it's been pretty hopeless. It's been a, a classic USA team that will beat everybody worse than them, <clears throat> Canada, and but Ooh, but been bad. not but not even come close to anybody be- beating anybody better than them. And I mentioned earlier that they're seriously, at least in the VNL, seriously lacking high ball firepower on the pins. Uh, if you are going to compete with teams that can serve like Brazil, Poland, and Russia, you'd better be able to score out of system sometimes. And if, if this USA, if this USA team can't do that, even getting to the podium will be extremely difficult for them. So um, that's why like if, if Taylor Sander is healthy, if he is capable of playing, he's in there, he's starting. I don't care rusty even if he's like at like 70 so, percent. yep rusty you know n- not a lot of chemistry i don't care he's an infinitely better option than any other outside hitter on this roster including tj defalco even at 70 percent. so the fact that he was named to this olympic roster tells me that 
by Tokyo, he'll be healthy enough to play. And I expect him to. I expect him to play every match. Um, it's the Olympics. And he's Taylor Sander, like enough said. If he isn't good enough, right? Say we don't see him this VNL and then an announcement comes out of the USAV that he's he's not healthy. Who steps in? Do we just go Sander for Sander? Yeah, his I, I, I think that's what it has to be. There's only one other outside hitter. Uh, on this roster yeah. it's it, brendan sander and then the other alternate is aaron russell who we know isn't going to be good in time right um but i mean like we did see brendan sander have a pretty good outing the other day what, what did he get i i know he not not good enough uh let's see okay no he got 12 points yeah he has 18 points so far never mind i take well that. yeah 12 points against germany he played a fine match against a team that that he should be good against um if, if taylor sander is not healthy enough to play this olympics we have no chance i'm just going to tell you that right now uh, I think if, if Taylor Sander couldn't play, then Anderson would absolutely go to the left without question. And I, I think if, if, if Taylor Sander was left off the roster, I think they would bring in Ben Patch before they would bring in Brendan Sander. Really? Oh, yeah. Hmm, interesting. They, they would be, have such a massive vacuum black hole at outside that they would have pretty much no choice but to move Anderson over there. And at that point, you bring the bad, the other opposite. I think that's what they would have to do. But I don't disagree with that. You're right. I, I, I'm really holding out hope for Taylor Sanders' health. But like I was saying earlier, this this VNL, as far as winning the tournament, is pretty much out the window at this point. Um, it just the way it is. You can just look at the numbers and no Micah Christensen, very little Taylor Sander, Anderson, whatever. But um, as Spira has done this entire tournament, as he'll continue to do these last couple weeks, he's going to get the most data from the guys that he has now named as Olympians as he can. So he figure out, he figures out really all the cards he has in his hand going into Tokyo. I think he has a plan. Um, I know that he is, he being Spra is not rattled by the fact that the team's not playing very well right now. He's so focused on the process and dealing with the clear substantial adversity that the team has dealt with that um, he's just going to take what he can out of this VNL and get back to LA and try to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all you can do in this scenario too, right? It's it's really just you gotta you gotta play with the pieces you have, and uh, you know what? Some of the key pieces for the USA are down, and I think that's sports sometimes. And I, I at at the end of the day, I still think the USA is the USA, and you guys have this. Um, maybe dumb ability. And I think this comes at all <laughs> sports levels of just believing in yourselves and no matter what and believing that, you know, you guys are the best. So who knows what could happen, right? Who knows what could happen at the, at the magic, Olymp- at, at, at the magic of the Olympics, right? Maybe Micah Christensen gets hot. Maybe uh, Matt Anderson becomes absolutely unstoppable. Maybe if the, the defense of Eric Shoji is just going to be too much, right? Who knows? But at the end of the day, I do, I, I do think that it's looking it's looking really slim right now, sitting in tenth um, in the the VNL, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, it's, I, I think it's, it's gonna be a struggle. It's easy to be pessimistic about where the U.S. is at right now. They have not passed the eye test this VNL. The there are question marks on the Olympic roster. I am still of the belief that they will show up to Tokyo ready to play, and I I believe they'll make it out of pools. I believe they will give themselves a chance to play for a medal. We'll see if if the cards fall that way. But you're right, they. They have a culture, a belief, whether it's blind and stupid or not, that they can do this. And that's the one thing that I will never doubt about USA Volleyball is that they, the staff, the players will completely buy into that fact. And I've been lucky enough to talk to some of the guys that did that in, in 2008. I've obviously gotten to know Lloyd Ball. I had Ryan Millar on my show. I had Don Sujo on my show who got injured and didn't go to Beijing, but was a huge part of that quad and that team. And they said that exact same thing. Because I, I asked, like, what was the point when you believed that winning Olympic gold was possible? Was it, like, match point in the gold medal match? Or was it at some other point? Was it years before in the quad? And they all gave kind of different answers, and there were obviously milestones along the way. But the the unilateral, like, consensus was that there was never a doubt that the team that they had was capable of winning Olympic gold. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's a massive deal. I think half or maybe even less of the teams going to the Olympics actually legitimately believe that they have a serious chance to win Olympic gold. I, I think that that is one of the hardest things about winning the Olympics is 
coming to mental terms with the fact that you, your individual and your team is capable of doing that because it's such a crazy task. I, I do think the difference, though, in 2008, they won the World League, right? They did. In, in, they did. They, they came they, in they hot. Won, they, 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 they won the World League. They beat the Brazil in the finals. And then they, right. they did the exact same thing in Beijing. Whereas th- this time around, they are not even making the, the playoffs. <laughs> albeit, you know, the playoffs are a little bit more difficult to make. Um, well, the whole world's different. We just had a year off because of COVID. We have all these people but hurt. The, the volleyball the VNL world is such a weird. Is, is oh yeah, different it, too, right? Oh yeah, it's not. It's, it's not, not just the US. US. It's everybody for sure. Back back then, you didn't have like you. You had Brazil. Um, it, Italy was good. You know, like the the teams weren't weren't where they are now. There, yeah, there was Russia. A, there Russia was, was just starting to become the Russia that we know now. But Poland even then, you didn't have teams like Poland. Iran. You know, right. Iran that could kind of pull out a game as 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 we've seen throughout this VNL, they've been stellar. Uh, the, they've been running with a Vladimir Alekno, and they've been dangerous to watch. They've kicked, yeah. they kicked both of our butts. Oh uh, my God, they destroyed the U.S. It wasn't even close. You know, and, oh, and, and, and that being said, at the at 2008, you didn't have a team like Canada. And I'll bet I, I will say, if we're going to talk about VNL for two seconds, please I, let's do it. I, I do think that Canada's two. And what are we like two, two and seven? seven. Or, um, uh, it is isn't as bad as it looks because I I do think that it's not personnel problems that we're seeing like with the USA team. It is our system right now just isn't clicking, and our players right now just aren't clicking together. When we lost to Slovenia, and that was by far our worst loss so far, they beat us the way that other teams, that we used to beat other teams. Beat other teams, yeah. Right? Well, Slovenia is really good, to yeah. their credit. Systematically, I'm super high on them. Systematically, and by playing well together. And that's just what you've seen so far from the Canadian team, is that guys just haven't played well together yet. And... That's why I'm still remaining very optimistic. And I'm, I think I'm going to do another podcast about this just to talk about Canada uh, because, you know, yeah, we're, you should. We're, we're, we're getting to the end of this. But I, I don't think while the results haven't been there, the play hasn't been that bad. We've seen multiple players have fantastic outings. Sure, we want to rag on Shawan Vernon Evans, but he scored 24 points against Brazil. <laughs> Right, he scored more points in in that you know game against Brazil than he did the entire season in Perugia, and <laughs> yeah, he's been bad at, at at certain times, and he's very much the same way as as Ben Patch that he lacks that court awareness sometimes and just swings hard into the block. But when he's good, he's good. You know, right now there's too many cooks in the kitchen for Team Canada. You've got three setters who are very good point, arguably all have a good shot to to to, yeah, to go same to, level right just, just like, like the usa women, women pretty similar I, I, absolutely right so i i think that there's just way more small pieces to that to, to need to be fixed uh, figured out and team canada is very much like a clock they're very much like a very nice watch and the fact that if one piece is just slightly off everything else else is off but Individually, I think we've seen some fantastic performances from literally all of the guys. Hogue has been great, especially from, been from, really good. from the baseline. Right, He's looking like a vintage Hogue. Perrin has been unstoppable at times. Both Sclater and Shawan Vernon Evan have, have had games. Right, TJ's been playing fantastic. Jay's had some flashes of brilliance. You know, I, Even though we haven't really seen Brett Walsh, I think Brett Walsh set two of our best games, the win against Argentina and the... You know the finally nail, the, the nail biter. Oh yeah, the, I mean don't don't get me started with that. And, and the nail biter uh, against Brazil, where you know Shawan scored scored twenty four points. I would like to see him some more, right? So I, I the the only big question mark for me is Stephen Marr, right? I'm wondering if he had to go through a concussion protocol after getting smoked in the head uh, by <laughs> DeFalco. DeFalco in destroyed game him. Because, oh, you know, when he was having a pretty good game up until that point, and he did kind of bounce back, but we haven't really seen him then. You well, know, came, he, he came, came in off, off the bench, bench for Lepke, who was awful in the first set. Yeah. That one. But, you know, Eric, yeah. Eric Lepke has, has really solidified the last game oh, yeah, against France. He had, he had 17 points and, and really led the show. So... I don't think that Canada's in as bad of a spot as the the standings show it. At, at I agree with that. Time. I think they need to uh, pull the plug on anybody playing libero who's not Blair Mann. Um, that that needs to stop right now. 
Um, I love Steve Marshall. Stop playing him there. I barely know who Jordan Pereira is. I don't know if he's seen a lot of playing time. Just, Whatever. just the one game against Brazil. But I do think okay. that Pereira played well against Brazil. However, like good for him. He's not in the picture whatsoever. But I, I know. But Blair don't. also needs some some time off, right? And I mean, like we, we, I don't know if you heard my podcast with him, and he was talking about, hey man, like. I need some time off, off, yeah. off too, and he he suffered an injury this year as well. And fifteen games in thirty days is a lot. So mm-hmm. I I do agree that come the Olympics he's going to be the guy. But right now he needs he needs to get some rest. I would be fully expecting to see him in the next six six matches. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at the men's VNL schedule that starts tomorrow. Uh, so, yeah, we've got the fourth round of games coming up. Um, tomorrow, I know we have Italy-USA. I don't really care because it's Italy's B team. I expect us to win. Um, Russia-Serbia. too. Well, ouch. <laughs> yeah, ouch. Ouch. That was a bad one. I was frustrated. Ouch. That was a bad one. Russia-Serbia is pretty spicy. Uh, Iran-Australia, that will be a beat down. Uh, Argentina-Bulgaria might be pretty good. Now that Argentina's got their whole team there. Uh, Japan and Germany, I don't really care. Canada-Poland, yikes. Uh-oh. Brazil, Slovenia, I think Brazil, is Slovenia is going to be awesome. One, I, I Dude, think that's Slovenia be is so the, good. maybe the They're, best game of the day. I think it is too. Slovenia is my. I mean, it's easy to pick them as kind of a Cinderella team at this point in the tournament because of how well they've played. But uh, they're awesome. I think. I think they're complete. I don't really think they have a whole lot of weaknesses. I think Tina Ernout is the man. Uh, so the Stern following Ch- day, Tonchek looks like Tonchek he can Stern actually, is the man. Looks like he can actually play with a team. Uh, and Shebul is yeah. the man. Yep. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Japan and Poland, the battle of Instagram, <laughs> oh, <laughs> battle yeah. of, of of horrible fans on the, the internet. The FIVB is you know oh, is very God. excited about that one. Uh, Canada, Germany, an opportunity for you guys to get a W. USA, France on Wednesday, I'm very excited for. Iran, Brazil, I'm very excited for. Yeah, I think that could one. be an underrated, spicy matchup. Uh, Russia, Argentina, that probably won't be close. Let's see, and then Thursday. USA, Netherlands, thank goodness we need one of those. Uh, Canada, Japan, you'd better not lose to Japan. Uh, Russia, Bulgaria, Argentina, Serbia. Watch, that's Japan's going to be the game that Nishida comes back. And you know what? Yeah, watch, even if we do beat them, they'll just be talking you'll have, about Nishida. You'll have, yeah, you'll have the power of 15 million anime fans on, on their side. You can't possibly beat that. <laughs> the comments on some of the YouTube oh, videos oh is being God. like, Leon's only a little bit better than Nishida. It's just like... <laughs> I don't even want to dignify that with a response. It's it's frustrating because like I love watching Japanese style of volleyball. Like I think it's so pure, it's so fast, they're so skilled, and I love watching. They, I mean, they well. beat they beat Russia to their credit. They, they did. They, they did beat Russia, and I think beat, especially like beating playing Japan at home is always so difficult. So playing Japan at home at the Olympics is going to be mind-blowing different. No, yeah, they, mind-blowing they, kill, different. they kill a ball, they land, and they all run laps around the court, and they do it I every love single that. point. I, I love that. I, like I love that so yeah, much. Yeah, I like it too. I still wonder if it's, like, are they running in specific patterns? Like, is it like is, are they like bees? I've always you know, wondered where, that. <laughs> where they have, like, a specific thing that they need to do? Or is it just, like, they're just looking for space? I, I don't I've really always, know. I've, I've always wondered that. Oh, well, let's see. What other fun games are there coming down the stretch, like in the fifth round? Uh USA Slovenia hasn't happened yet. Um, France Iran will be pretty spicy. Those two teams don't like each other all that much. I, I think that your guys is like your guys schedule is much easier now. Yeah. France yeah, and, and, we are, and and Slovenia, and Slovenia are the Slovenia, only two that's it. two games. But like Italy, Netherlands, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Japan should should all be wins for for you guys. Agreed. Yeah, we got Brazil, Poland, Russia. Iran out of the way already and we also lost to Serbia but yeah you never know I, I don't expect us to make the finals I'm not going to be pissed off if we don't make the finals without most of the starters like that 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 doesn't bother me it's um, it's very similar to Canada's schedule we've got Poland Germany Japan Netherlands Australia Serbia so okay. I'm hoping that tomorrow is the day we start figuring things out I think in the last the last round you know we played terribly against Slovenia we got three dicked hard it was bad. Um, <laughs> Russia, Russia was a sloppy game on either side. I, I felt like we had opportunities to take it. We had the opportunity to send it to the fifth, and it was just a little ugly. It was kind of a little all, all over the place, but we almost forced forced that fifth set. But whatever against yeah, France, Canada, we, C- Canada, Poland tomorrow is not 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 going to be fun for you. I don't it's know. I d- I disagree. I think we're going to pull out a. 
pull out a a, a good performance. I have faith. I really, I, I really don't. I really don't think that at all. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, buddy. <laughs> hey, you know what? At this point, I'm just looking to see. I I was very inspired. I don't know if that's the right word, but I was d- I heartened. I guess you could say the the opposite of, of disheartened uh, by their performance <laughs> against against France. I think it was better. Yeah. I, I I I truly think that it was better, and that we were looking at. You know, once again, forcing a, a fifth set and it just didn't happen. But once that click happens and once this team figures out how to play together, whew, the Maple ball- Volleys are going to be in town. Because individually, you know, it's it's going good. It's just the errors. We're making fucking 30 plus errors a game. Sorry for swearing. Yeah, it's but it's, 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 it's just been hard, hard to it's watch too many. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you know this, that Canada's a, a very process built team as well. You, you already mentioned it. Uh, they'll. I, ha- I have absolute faith that they will figure it out. They'll put it together. I think Hogue is using this tournament correctly. I think they're going to go back to Canada for a few weeks and, and really get the most out of that time too. But like the, the rest of this VNL, at least just as putting on my neutral volleyball fan hat really quickly, the, the, the top of this tournament and the finals are actually going to be electric. Like um, Brazil beat Poland the other day in a close but really fun to watch 3-0. Poland beat Russia in that little triangle. France beat Brazil earlier in a crazy match. So like the, I think those four teams plus Slovenia. So Brazil, Poland, France, Russia, Slovenia, those five, I think are, are fighting for the top four spots with, with maybe Iran in there as well. Um, but there, there's going to be some really fun matches. Seven wins as well. But they've had a very, very easy schedule. So far. you're right. You're, you're probably right. They've had a very easy schedule so far. So yeah, Serbia gets Russia tomorrow. Then Bulgaria, Argentina, that's certainly doable. They have Australia, that's pretty easy. The Netherlands, that's pretty easy. Wow, maybe I was wrong. Maybe they have already played everybody good. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Serbia makes a run. And I, I think I predicted that before this tournament because they're not going to Tokyo, so they have nothing else to play for. They might as well go and win VNL. Um, I want to restate for the record that I hate Euros Kovacevic. I just think that has to be said. Right. The dude, The dude absolutely had his way with the USA the other day, and it was in such a way that is more frustrating to watch than any other player on the planet. And I just didn't like it very much. So I didn't appreciate that. I, I do agree. I, I don't really enjoy watching him play all that much either, but uh, Hey, you know what? I think Serbia is still a great team team to watch overall. I just, Serbia is good. And what they just need a center. Weirdly enough, Atanasiewicz is actually playing pretty good volleyball right now. Where the hell was that all year? Maybe the fact that Tragica can't set a right side ball. If yeah, if you're in the situation where Nikola Jovovich is an upgrade over your club setter, that's a problem. Yeah, uh, I I definitely think so. Um, Cuban spike, you guys don't sleep. Russia three, Serbia one. <laughs> I mean, it's only like I guess it's eleven o'clock Eastern, 10, 10 p.m. Uh, Central. It's and you know, man, this is nothing. I could go forever. Ronnie, aren't you in like Barcelona or something? Like it's like four a.m. there. Good point. Yeah, dude, go to bed. Yeah, seriously. Don't be talking about us not sleeping. You're the one not sleeping. 5 a.m. Okay. And maybe he's oh, just getting up, getting up for work, but uh, I guess that, that makes sense. Get the work well, done. Watch volleyball the rest of the day. That's been my strategy throughout this VNL. Very daytime-friendly games in the back half. Fortunately, they haven't put the USA at like 3 a.m. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree. I don't think that Canada has any early games left. I think the women do. The women have two four AMers in back to back, which that'll be that'll be crappy. And I mean, we do have a, a six AMer against against Serbia uh, on the last day of the tournament. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes. I have faith. I mean, we're over the halfway point for for both of our squads, but I have faith that both Canada and the USA are going to start figuring it out, and we're going to see. I I here's my prediction: we're going to see more wins in the back half of this tournament than we have seen in the front half. I mean, mathematically, that that is extremely likely. But uh, I agree with you. I think better volleyball is still to come for both of our teams. Uh, yeah, we. I think we covered it in a hell of a lot of detail. Yeah, I, I feel, feel very good about, about that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, anything else we want to talk about? Any any other shout outs we want to give? Well, well just, just just interesting to follow along with the calendar is now that the USA have announced their Olympic rosters on both sides. See if the dominoes start to fall with the rest of the teams, or if they wait till after VNL, like I would kind of expect most of them to do. Um, but as those get named, it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, check out the rest of VNL. I think the rest of VNL is awesome. And if you want to complain at me about how much I like Team USA, follow me on Instagram at rstclair1 and DM me your arguments. I'll, I'll 
I'm more than happy to argue with anybody who wants to. And the, the Discord as well. Obligatory shout out to the Discord. Yeah, of course. Once again, if you're not, if you haven't joined the Volleyball Source Discord, we've been having just a constant influx of people recently. Like every, every day, a, a few more people come in. I don't know where they're finding it, but I'm very glad that you are. Um, come hang out. We've got truly now some of like some of the best minds and voices in volleyball more than half the vnl commentators in the yes. bubble are relying upon the discord for their research like no yeah. joke they're in there you know they're in there they're asking questions people are being super helpful it's, it's a lot of fun i love i've said this before i love waking up and seeing all of me too it's the best it's the best up. um but yeah one one thing ronnie just said uh cuban spike just said uh asked usa and canada withdrew from u21 champs i don't think so um, and uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the draw is happening tomorrow. Um, I, think the, I think the draw happened today. I didn't see, I didn't see the U.S. in any of them, but I, I don't I, follow I, that as much I, as I think, Ronnie or Dan might, for example. Yeah, I, I think um, the U19 happened today. Um, draw happened today, and neither Canada or the U.S. usually play U19 because it's it's at an awkward time that coincides with our school year and, and stuff okay. like that. Whatever. Um, but I do know, I'm pretty sure that Canada will be going to the U21 World Championships because generally, like, they have holes for teams um, per because we didn't have uh, a qualification. Right. Of, of, of there COVID. were there were a couple of holes in, in the yeah. one I saw today. So and, and generally, they just go to the highest ranked uh, team uh, in the U21 rankings, and Canada's in the top eight right now because we finish better than the U.S. on, on a regular basis at the junior level. So we never, play, we never play well in juniors because it doesn't matter. I mean... <laughs> Whatever. All right. All right. Also, also, also check, check out. out uh, I'm, I'm I'm working on writing on volleyballsource.ca. Uh, Sixteen to one rankings for the men's VNL uniform sets. Like once once you're done, get, that, let me know and we'll we'll debate it. Yeah, we'll live, do a podcast about it. Sure. Yeah, you can come rip me to shreds on air, or if if you agree with with my takes. But yeah, I'm I'm writing all that up in tremendous detail with all the photos and all that. So if you like uh, nerding out about sports uniforms and want to apply that to a volleyball setting, I'm I'm writing something up about that. So stay tuned. All right, guys, I think that's enough. It's a uh, quarter after eleven here. It's time for bed, uh, so we can watch up or wake up early and watch more volleyball tomorrow. Peace. All right, peace, guys. Have a good one. See ya.